I know where I'm at. And you did that with Walk Between the Raindrops. Back then, Edge of Quarrel. Back, what's his name? Edge of Quarrel. Oh, uh, Dave, Dave Larson, who we what? actually talk about you in the Edge of Coral interview, because I, I actually distribute Edge of Coral. Okay. There's something else I wanted to talk with you about later. But wait, before I forget, yeah, I, need to, I, need to, I need to ask this. So here, we got the beautiful God Money DVD. My question for you is this. You got Blink-182, you got Pennywise, you, uh, you Downer. I even forgot Downer was on this. I was just at John's house the, the other day. MXPX, Stainsaker, Rollins Band. Darren? Was it a nightmare getting all that music in one place? Um, I'm kind of forgetting how on earth I even did it. You know, it's kind of like when you look at, you know, I, I grew up drawing and wanting to be a comic book artist. And you'd look at work that you did when you were like 13, 14 years old. How did I spend so much time doing that, right? I look back at that. And to me, that was going to college. I learned about, you know, master use and sync licenses and attorneys and, you know, how do you get the rights to the stuff and what do you pay? And then Pennywise found out I paid 15 grand for a Descendants song. And Pennywise said, well, we're not going to be less than the Descendants and something like that, you know. And it was like learning about all this stuff. Is that why they weren't on that cassette sampler that you handed it out for the... uh... Who oh, that I handed out? You handed out, it. yeah. Um, <laughs> who who wasn't on it? Pennywise or Descendants? It was uh, Pennywise was not was not on it. Yeah, I think that's why. I think it was. Yeah, I, I think that's 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 probably why. But no, I just learned. I I always loved. I probably loved. Again, I probably should have been. Uh, I should. I probably should have been something else other than a filmmaker. But filmmaking was the only thing I knew how to do. But I did all the business around everything that I did, and. You know, probably was focused more on business than I was my actual craft, which is why I probably never, to this day, I've ever felt comfortable on the set. I was always thinking about everything else that I had to do. But yeah, I don't know how I even got all that. I mean, I, I, I remember being, I was probably with you and we were like still getting a master copy of like a Fireside song. Not Fireside, Farside. Far yeah, there might be a Fireside song on there, but Farside, <laughs> like, and which, by the way, I think it's one of my favorite Farside songs of all time. That's on that soundtrack. Like, I don't even know how we got that song. Well, and that song would then go on to be covered by Gaslight Anthem, and it would be like, yeah, yeah, like it's it's crazy. Because that was an like, unreleased track, right? That was an yeah, unreleased it was, track. It was. I hope you're unhappy. <sighs> that's right. Yeah. Okay, you see, so it's like I don't even know how I did it, but I learned I. I had a really good lawyer at the time. I think a woman named Stacy Fass who kind of became like a mentor to me on like legal things. Like it just, it was just way too much. I was always in over my head. It just, I've, I've, I've never not been in, in over my head. You know that. You've seen me in over my head. Well, um, I, I have just a few more questions for you. One, one of the things, speaking of being in over, over our respective heads, when we did Black Friday, like it's, it's pretty amazing so you and I wrote that script in a week. Yep. And then um, I remember before we did that, I remember kind of like your because, keys. Your keys were so loud. <laughs> you in my house. Game. That was the boxing. That game. was the boxing game. You would then play the boxing, and it was <laughs> so loud. I'll never forget. I'll be like Evan. People don't realize we kind of lived together. I'm yeah. Tell you the story about the boxing game earlier in the day we talked and he said you know what you're like about a 10 like good for like a roommate so then later that night i'm playing the boxing game i'm slamming the keys from from, from upstairs you just all i saw was sort of a little bit of your body upstairs and you go you're now at a two (laughs) and i was like i was like okay okay um it was great i think i may have lost because i wasn't able to be like in my in my my gosh in the uh, game but I remember one of the things that you really taught me on that was, because one of the things that you were even preaching back then was just the idea about people being afraid. You said they're not afraid of failure, they're afraid of success. Right, yeah. And I remember you telling me that. Yeah. And because you, you call me up and you say, listen, I'm gonna give you three grand, I want you to I want you to come up here and write the script, so you, we'll get it done and you're paid and leave. Yeah. And I was like, I was like great. Yeah. But then you told me what it was about, about bio-nuclear war, no, I'm sorry, biotechnological warfare. And yeah, weapons, house. and yeah. And I remember I was like, 
I was like, Darren, I can't do it. Like, right. I'm not going to be able to do it. And you, and you were like, Evan, like, like, I, I, I think this is something that's always hurt you as a writer is that like the audience only knows what we tell them. So if you tell them this crazy thing that's going to blow up a house exists, because remember it was like a, yeah. wasn't it an explosion that sucked back yeah. into the, into the yeah. house? Yeah, that's right. And I, I guess my question it's for imploded. you is... It imploded. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, my, my question for you was, you had a lot riding on you for that, for yeah. that movie. Yeah. Like, like, how were you able... Because we were also stuck at one point. I think we took your dog for a walk. And that's how we came up with the whole switch about how Gary's character goes into prison and yep. whatnot. And we were, and we, we, we had this whole thing that he was sort of in on what was happening in the uh, house. Right. Yeah. By the way, I have like multiple copies of Black Friday, like right here. Oh nearby. my gosh. But um, because I used to, I would see them at Walmart and they were in these slim home. Wait, do I have a, hold on, hold on. I want oh I want to get out to show you. Hold on. Where is it? Come on, Black Friday. I know that it's here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got this one. I got this one from Blockbuster. Turn it. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Sorry, sorry. I got, yeah. I got, I got, yeah. I got so Look excited. at that. Look at that. Not a but, bad, um, it's not a bad cover. No, look, and then we got the back and like, back. what's going, what's going on? Which was, by the way, there's no tunnel in the movie. There's no sword in the there's movie. There's no <laughs> There's no sword. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Darren, I'm, I'm saying you were like kind of, you really like illuminated uh, it for me. And so my my question is, because you really made me also realize. He took the sword from the guy. He took, remember, he oh. he took the sword at one point. Okay. Oh, no, oh, was that see. Ides of March? No, it was Ides of March. Sorry, you're they, right. Exactly. You're right. And I, I almost wrote Ides of March. It there's very, no, there's very no. You're not writing it, but like kind of rewriting or something. Yes. But at one point, and it's still odd to me that this happened, you and Ken gave me a script, Surviving in Today's World. Do you still have it? Do you still have it? I might have a copy of it. Like It's the, on only, it. it's the only movie I still consider maybe doing. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'm going, which, okay, wait, you know what? I'm going to forget this question right now. You're, you did a thing. You're not making like like feature films anymore right. you still make films you just make yeah what like can you elaborate on that just in case if other people haven't you know seen that because i was surprised to hear that just yeah. because when you and i met that was the thing you know a feature film a feature film a feature film yeah i think but, i think that's what i had to rethink which was that there that there's a form of um hedonism which once you get to a feature where do you go right and it, it's, a, it's a tough subject for me to talk about. One, be, one, because you never want, I don't believe you ever want to talk bad about your projects because your projects live with other people. Mm -hmm. and, and when people poop all over their projects, you're actually pooping on somebody who enjoyed it. Right. Right? But here's the thing. I don't think, um, I don't think I'm good at it. There, there's a, there's a, if you're not good at it, then well, what in the world am I doing? Well, hold on, hold on. I'm, <laughs> when I finished God Money, I knew I had all the abilities to be probably a pretty darn good cinematic, like, I got the chops. Well, it like, got you a lot of work. Like, in terms of people wanting to work with you, they would see yeah, that movie. No, and, I, I, yeah. no, I remember getting comments from Fincher, and I remember getting comments from... Um, What's your name? Did um, um, American History X um, and but, you know? Dude, but you had executives that yeah. were like, "Hey, let's I get yeah. to do I, it because they knew that you could deliver." Yeah, it was like this kid can direct. Like this kid can direct. Right. You know what I mean? Um, and I had that in, in agents talking and talking with studios. And I was in those meetings, and I I knew. But the thing was, even that early on, I kind of knew that to keep going that direction. I was probably going to go insane in that when you start to think about doing a movie, you really have to block out the entire world. You, you get so myopic and to be a genius, you have to leave everything and everyone. 
And I knew pretty early on, like, man, this is gonna be if I go down this route, like I don't know if I'm I don't know if I'm coming out. It wasn't like it wasn't a um an excuse not to work hard, but the process of what it took. I didn't. Th- I just didn't think I was good at it. Like I didn't think I was made for it. Even though I made ten more movies, I kept trying to find the way in which I was was going to create. And so I did four two K. Right after that, five days. Yep. Very little money. On film, though. On, on film. I mean, on, and that's something that you can't, like, like, yeah. like that, that would be even harder now. Right. And you did it then when everyone right. was, I'm saying, I was yeah. shooting an 8mm video on yep. TV, you know, like, yeah. It just, I never felt comfortable. Again, I probably should have been an editor. I probably should have been a producer. I probably should have been everything else but a director. But because I was able to communicate, kind of look like I was semi-confident and I could... You know, I was kind of, and I, there was no other option. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to be an editor in 1994 and have a right. career. It's like, I had to do everything. So I just did everything. Again, I'm thankful for all the projects I've been able to make. I stand behind them. But I've never, I had never felt comfortable a day in my life walking on the set. I hated the process. What I always loved was improv, shooting really fast. Like that stuff I loved. And so 20 something years later, I started, it was probably the Jason Mraz, I'm yours music video of just, let's just go to Hawaii and shoot. That I, you never stopped directing. You no, never, you never, no. like I'm saying, even, but see Darren, like even feeling that way, you talk about being comfortable, you were still directing, you were still making these movies. So, so, is it, was it like that, feeling like that, even when you were in Hawaii doing doing the Jason Mraz video? Like, no, like, no, that's when, it, well, because what happened a few months before that, or five, six months before that, uh, a good friend of mine, Peter King, who's now one of my business partners. I was, I, photography. Yeah, and, and, I, I, and I, was at, I was at Hurley, and he said, I want to take you out to Salva Land. I was like, what's Salva Land? He's like, Steve Alba. I was like, Steve Alba, Steve Alba? He's like, still backyard skating. He's like, I think we should make a show. So we just went out and I spent months just shooting on the HVX. I was composing, but it was in the mood. We're hopping fences and running from cops and filming and I was documenting, but it was cinematic and something was happening. And I was coming back and I was editing and I was telling stories and I was like, this is, this is fun. Like, th- like I had never felt so like, this is, this is, this is home for me. And then right after that, the Jason Mraz video pops up and he didn't want to make a video. And I just said, what if we went to Hawaii and just filmed? He's like, all right. And we started making that video and I, and I was having that same feeling being with Steve Alba. And I was like, Oh, I think this is, this is, you know, I don't talk a lot about what I was meant to do, but this was like, it was punk rock. It was grabbing your guitar or grabbing the drums and just playing. It's just grabbing the camera. The technology was there with 24 P and digital and lenses and 35 millimeter lens adapters. And I was like, I think I can shoot run and gun. I, I had all the, I had all the freedoms in me of a Jim Jarmusch or a Harmony Corinne. Like, I wanted to be weird places with weird people, but I knew that I could put the camera low and shoot something the way Kubrick would shoot it. Like, I knew, I knew that it's not like I thought I was better, but I knew that there was very few people who could speak the language of a Harmony Corinne and a Kubrick. Yeah. 